All right, Bonacetta, good evening. What's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich. Business time. Mob Story Season 2. Let's get right into it. But before we do, tonight's video is sponsored by Justice Tech Pro. Salute to Dominic and his whole crew over there. Please subscribe to Justice Tech Pros on YouTube. They're giving out a lot of good business, a lot of good information. You never know when you need some knowledge in your life. Please go check them out. Let's get right down to business, as I like to say. Gentlemen, wipe your feet on the rug. Throw some smoke in the atmosphere. Do not forget to let me know what you guys are throwing up in the air. All right? Tonight, a little bit of Pineapple Express for me, and it's doing me justice. From the button, guys, at the www.newyorkmafia.com. Salute. The Cherry Hill Gambinos Part 3. Joe and Rosario Gambino. Soap Stars. Quote, thank God for the American justice system, unquote. Joe Gambino, after he was acquitted for tax evasion in 1985. After their failed attempt to open a restaurant nightclub in their brother's honor, and after being thrown in the middle of all the pizza and cheese war drama, things got worse for Joe and Rosario. On Tuesday, March 18, 1980, while enjoying an evening at Valentino's, Federal agents arrested the two brothers on charges of conspiracy to smuggle 91 pounds of heroin into the U.S. from Milan, Italy. The crackdown was a combined efforts between the FBI and the Italian police and other arrests were made that night as well. Domenico, Emmanuel, and Antonio Adamita were arrested in Italy. Italian police seized heroin at Antonio's home which had been packaged in containers and placed in a cardboard box destined for Centro Nostri Italian distributors on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn. According to authorities, the drugs had an estimated street value between 70 and 120 million. Originally, Judge John F. Jerry had set Joe and Rosario's bail at 3 million each based on a recommendation from a judge in Brooklyn after prosecutors told him that without a high bail, the Gambino brothers might attempt to flee the country. However, when Joe and Rosario appeared at their bail hearing on March 20th, Judge Jerry changed his mind and reduced their bail to $250,000 each, saying, on one hand, these brothers are suspected of having committed a terribly serious crime. On the other hand, they have roots in the community. Prosecutors were none too happy and argued that Joan Rosario should be required to pay the full bail because they were the principal movers of heroin in the United States. But Judge Jerry didn't agree, adding, this court will not engage in speculation engendered by the last names of the defendants. Joan Rosario were free after posting $25,000 each, 10% of their original bail. All defendants were to be tried in both Italy and the U.S. at a later date. But the fun was just beginning. Days of our lives. Joe and Rosario edition. On the evening of Friday, March 21st, three days after Joe and Rosario were arrested and one day after they were released on bail, Angelo Bruno, the boss of the Bruno crime family in Philadelphia, was murdered. He had been sitting in the car outside his home when he was killed by a shotgun blast to the back of the head. Almost immediately, Joe and Rosario were the stars of a new soap opera. Newspapers started reporting information given to them by anonymous law enforcement sources that Joe and Rosario were involved in the murder. One report said that Bruno had learned about the smuggling operation in the late 1979 while in Milan with Nicodemo Scarfo and then tipped police. Newspapers also try to link Bruno's appearance at the SCI office in Trenton the Friday morning of his murder to the Gambinos as well. Bruno was being represented by Sal Lavina at the meeting, the same attorney who was representing Joe in the smuggling case. However, Michael Siovage, executive director of the SCI, dismissed that rumor saying that, quote, if SCI testimony had anything to do with it, he would have been killed three years ago, unquote. But the SCI never revealed why Bruno was at the SCI offices that day in the first place. 
The Gambino brothers were never implicated in the Bruno's murders, and the rumors were just that, rumors. And it wouldn't be the last time the law enforcement tried to link the Gambino brothers to some dastardly deeds either. Even though a drug trial was looming ahead, Joe and Rosario forged ahead and continued to do what they did best, run successful businesses, a.k.a. business. Moving ahead. In July 1980, Joe decided he wanted to reinvent Valentino's Supper Club to attract a more mature crowd. He closed it temporarily to do some remodeling as well as create a new menu and a new name for it. At the same time, Rosario opened up a new disco called The Late Show. The club didn't sell alcohol, which made it a popular spot for the 15 to 18-year-old crowd who didn't have any place to hang out in Cherry Hill. Valentino's reopened in late September 1980 as the New York, New York. It offered a new Italian continental menu featuring such items as veal rollentini a la New York, New York, steak and lobster, as well as a variety of pastas. It got great reviews and became almost as popular as Valentino's. For the late show, however, it wasn't as rosy. Law enforcement officials weren't too thrilled that the Gambino brothers were going about their business as usual. They seemed to forget that Joe and Rosario had only been accused of drug smuggling, not convicted. Still, they targeted the brothers every chance they could, especially Rosario. In September 1980, only a few short months after it opened, a huge fight took place in the parking lot of The Late Show. Police said that the fight had ensued between several young men and over 400 people had gathered outside to cheer on the fighting. One man was stabbed but survived. Within weeks, the Cherry Hill Town Council revoked the club's amusement license. During the investigation... Camden County prosecutors discovered that Rosario had signed an agreement with local police promising not to allow alcohol on the premises, even with the BYOB law that was in effect for clubs without a liquor license. They also discovered that township building officials knew of the Gambino brothers' history, but gave them the necessary permits to open anyway. One building official told the Courier Post, quote, the Gambinos are part of the scenery of Cherry Hill. They may be the mafia, but they deserve the same treatment as anybody else from this office, unquote. But despite Rosario's best efforts to regain his license, his appeals were denied and the club was closed permanently. Back in Brooklyn, John was quietly watching the madness unfold in Cherry Hill. He may have been concerned, but there were bigger events unfolding in his native home of Italy and he'd need to conjure up some of his best charismatic magic to stop the disaster. International Peacemaker. Who would want to travel to Italy to meet with the most ruthless mobster in history, especially when he was killing your family members left and right? Well, according to several sources, that's exactly what John did. Totorina who was the most powerful head of, of the Corleonesi family and the bosses of all bosses in Sicily, had started slaying his rivals in what was called the Second Mafia War in that country. Rina's main focus was the Paso di Ragano family, headed by John's cousin and associate Salvatore Inzarello, as well as the families headed by Inzarello's close allies Stefano Botante and Gettiano Badalamenti. While some sources say the war started because these families were challenging Rina's power, other sources state that it had more to do with all the money those families were making in the drug trafficking business. Profits they were not sharing with, quote unquote, the beast. That was Toto Rina's nickname, the beast. Because if you know the history, the beast. Whatever the true cause of this second mafia war, John's family and associates in Italy were in trouble. Rina first assassinated Botante in April 1981. Then in May, Inzarello was killed. What followed was a massacre with nearly a thousand men losing their lives in the bloody battle between 1981 and 1983. Rina had also ordered the assassination of any Inzarello who tried to flee to the United States. At some point, 
Gambino boss Paul Castellano reportedly sent John to Italy to defuse the situation. However, it seems more like that John went on his own since he would have already had a better idea of the happenings there and reported back to Castellano rather than the other way around. But there is no information to substantiate that, and it's also not clear when exactly John traveled to Italy. When John arrived in Italy, he met with Riina to negotiate for the lives of his Italian friends, family, and associates. Against all odds, his magic worked. The Inzarellos were allowed to live, but they would be banished from Italy. They became known as the Gli Scapati, or the Runaways. Soon after, two Inzarellos affiliated with the Gambino family were killed under mysterious circumstances, perhaps as a warning from the Ina to follow the rules. First, Antonio Nino Inzarello, the capo of the South Jersey crew with John and John's brother-in-law, disappeared in October of 1981. According to LCNBios.com, Castellano had ordered the hit on Nino because of the war. This was according to Gravano testimony. It was alleged that John had lured him into a delicatessen in Brooklyn where another Gambino family member committed the murder. Nino's body was never found. Pietro Inzarello was found murdered in January of 1982. Pietro was the brother of Salvatore Inzarello and alleged and a alleged soldier in John's crew. His body was found frozen stiff in the trunk of a car, handcuffed, shot several times in the head, and wrapped in a plastic bag. A $5 bill was stuffed in his mouth, and a $2 bill was on his genitals. The murder was never solved. Even after successfully saving his brethren, John didn't have a lot of room to breathe. But luck was on his side, at least temporarily. Salute to the button guys at www.newyorkmafia.com. Another amazing article. Let's not forget, the video tonight was sponsored by Justice Tech Pros. Salute to Dominic and his old crew. And of course, it's your boy Big Rich. Team Ruckus. Mob Story Season 2. Everybody have a good evening. We will talk soon. Salute.